uh, we are starting. Uh, thank you one more time for joining to this uh, workshop organized together with Lab Clinics, Agricera distributor in Spain and Portugal. I know that there are researchers from different corners of the world joining us today, not only from Spain and Portugal, and everybody is very warmly welcome. And uh, first, I would like to tell you a little bit about Agricera location. Uh, we are located uh, at a polar, polar circle almost. Uh, therefore, in the winter, we have a polar night and beautiful northern lights, and in the summer, we have constant light here. And it looks more or less like that. Um, our company has been established quite a long time ago. 1985, we started in this uh, beautiful surrounding of northern Sweden. We have 55 employees and we are part of All In Group since uh, year 2020. Agricera is also ISO certified. And uh, here you see location of our antibody production farm, but we also have another facility in Umeå uh, where we are purifying and testing antibodies and shipping them worldwide. Western blot is a technique which allows us to visualize a specific protein in a complex mix. And I wonder if you know how old that technique really is. Uh, it has been established by two independent laboratories already in 1979. And until now, it is still the most uh, widely used um, technique for protein detection in complex mixture. You probably are familiar with other methods and why the name of Western blot. We have Southern blot for DNA. We have Northern blot for RNA. We have Eastern blot for post-translation modifications and we have Western blot for proteins. And the name Western blot comes from the fact that the lab which uh, initiated this technique was located on the West Bank. So therefore Western blot. And as you are familiar, this uh, technique is based on the concept of a sandwich. I hope you have uh, eaten your breakfast and uh, I will just remind you how the sandwich is uh, uh, prepared. Uh, the sandwich which will allow us to transfer proteins from separated electrophoretically in a gel to a membrane. And uh, this transfer is done when the electrical current is applied through the sandwich. So we have sheets of filter paper, we have our gel where electrophoretically our complex protein mixture have been separated and then the proteins uh, which are separated are transferred to the membrane due to the application of uh, uh, electrical current. And the result needs to be an exact copy. So what we are after is to uh, make an exact copy of a gel, which will appear on the membrane. And who is doing a job of visualization of our specific protein separated on a gel based of molec on molecular weight? It is um, an antibody, a protein, which is uh, Y-shaped. In this case, what I'm showing you is just a reminder of how an IgG from a mammal like a goat, mouse or rabbit is looking. And uh, we have a very important part uh, marked by yellow. It is an antigen binding domain. That's where the binding between an antibody and the protein occurs. And we have that part is located in so-called FAB region, which is, which is changeable region of um, antibody. And we have also so-called handle, which is an, called FC region, fragment that crystallized, uh, because during research on IgGs, uh, that part crystallized in the in a cooler and therefore it's part, uh, it's called fragmented crystallized. It's so-called constant region 
uh, which will also facilitate antibody purification using protein G and A, because that part of the antibody has affinity to protein A or G. But the most important part is the antigen binding domain, and that's also the part which is changing. And the uh, antibodies, probably you heard about antibodies from LAMAS. Uh, they are, as you see, um, a little bit different. They are smaller and therefore uh, can be preferable in other techniques than Western blot, like, for example, immunolocalization. What we want uh, as a result of antibody work is that it specifically binds to our target protein. So, where is the binding between antibody uh, and a, a specific protein taking place? How is it uh, happening? Antibodies are recognizing so-called linear epitopes, which are subsequent amino acids in a protein, linear protein structure. So, these linear epitopes are recognized uh, in techniques when proteins are unfolded, like Western blot or immunohistochemistry. And as you see here, there, this is an example of a binding antibody binding domain is binding into three linear amino acids. So in this, in Western blot, we are working with detection by antibody of linear epitopes. However, Antibodies are also binding to discontinuous epitopes. These epitopes are uh, allowing to detect uh, when anti amino acids are brought by threefold of the in a threefold of the protein, distant amino acids can be brought together, and this will create so-called discontinuous epitope, which can be detected by an antibody. Please remember this mechanism is quite uh, important for successful binding of the antibody to the target protein. What happens next? We have linear and uh, discontinuous epitope detected by an antibody. And we are also, you're probably familiar with polyclonal and monoclonal or recombinant antibodies. What's the difference? Uh, poly means many, so polyclonal antibodies will recognize pools of several epitopes. So depending how the protein is processed by the immune system of the immunized animal, the pool of epitopes can consist of antibodies recognizing three, five, ten amino acids in a linear, in a row. OK, poly means many, so it will be a pool of epitopes. It will not be one epitope in case of polyclonal antibodies. Monoclonal antibodies, on contrary, they recognize only one epitope. As you saw on the previous slide, the epitope can be three, between three, but up to 15 amino acids. So in case of polyclonal antibodies, we have a pool of epitopes. In case of monoclonal antibodies, antibody is binding only to one epitope. It's very important for successful antibody detection, actually. And keep in mind, depending where on a protein monoclonal antibody is binding, it may only be suitable for one technique. Because if an epitope which monoclonal antibody is binding, is not exposed in the native protein uh, because it's hidden inside the fold, this antibody may only work in Western blot. So polyclonal antibodies may be more versatile because they, this, they consist of the pool of epitopes to, uh, which can be different, linear, linear exposed, non-exposed, and so on. Antibody choice, when you are choosing an antibody for your work in Western blot, it must match species and application. And one can think like, how can I 
um, know if my antibody is going to work. I just go to the lab and try it. Well, I, actually, you can save your time in the lab by doing some theoretical analysis or by asking questions. For example, many antibodies which Agricera is designing are made to very conserved short peptides, which will be from 7 to 30 amino acids long. And this means that with one and the same antibody, target protein from multiple species can be detected. So as you see here, this is the antigen binding domain. So an antibody is recognizing, let's say it an epitope 15 amino acids long, a linear one. And that epitope is found in the same protein from different species. Therefore, one antibody can be used to detect target protein from a very wide range of species. And it is actually possible to predict antibody reactivity doing a sequence analysis. If um, sequence the antibody is made to is not displayed by the um, antibody supplier, you can always ask the question. So how do I choose the right antibody for my protein? In case of uh, antipeptide antibodies, they can be made to N terminal part or to very C terminus, or there can be a sequence chosen from the middle of the protein. Of course, in this case, also not from the signal peptide, which is cleaved off. So that sequence the antibody is made to need to be conserved and repeated in the protein you aim to detect. If the homology level is too low, the antibody is not going to bind. And it is possible to predict this doing sequence analysis before you even do a Western blot. Please remember also that antibodies can actually create false positive results. It has happened several times. I've seen it. Therefore, good controls can uh, have to be included. And, and if there is a poor homology with a peptide to the species, to the protein from the species, researcher wants to use an antibody, uh, we are uh, strongly advising not to use it. If there is no sequence available, we also strongly advise not to use such antibody because false positive results happen quite often. Of course, if an antibody is made to a whole protein, uh, the sequences can be easily aligned. But the mistake, which is very often done, is that um, antibodies made to the peptide, but researchers align whole sequences, look at homology level and assume it's going to work. It is not if an antibody is made to a short peptide. So required, required is over 70% uh, sequence identity. Of course, we're talking about linear sequence. I would like to just remind you how antibody binding uh, occurs. So we have our target protein, which is uh, separated on a gel. Western blot is a quantitative technique. Uh, the complex mix is separated based on the molecular weight. Uh, if we're talking uh, in um, about uh, one dimensional gel electrophoresis, and then we have a primary antibody which is binding to the target, uh, specifically recognizing a specific sequence in the antigen binding domain. Uh, and then we have a secondary antibody which will be uh, binding to the primary. And the secondary antibody is labeled with a fluorescent dye or an enzyme and uh, it will allow us visualization of binding of the primary antibody. There's also a possibility to use directly labeled primary antibodies, which will shorten your protocol. Uh, and it's also uh, working quite well for proteins of uh, high and medium expression. And as you know, Western blot has quite many steps. Uh, it's a quite complex procedure, uh, and I'm going to address uh, um, each of them based on the questions which I have received over the years. Actually, that complicated procedure can also be um, 
made easier and optimized. And I am going to show you how. Theory is good, but how about practice? Please take a look at these results. It is a Arabidopsis sample from four different laboratories and a primary antibody, which is the same in each case. But each lab was applying a little bit different protocol. And as you see, results vary considerably. The protein which was uh, to be detected is a P4. It's a transcription factor, so it is a, not an easy protein. It's not Rubisco. And a sample had to be collected at the right time point, has to be promptly uh, processed, and so on and so forth before any antibody binding could be visualized. So it's not always an antibody which is bad. It is a whole procedure uh, which um, needs to be optimized to allow successful detection. How much do you know about a protein which is to be detected by an antibody? Think about it. What do you know about that protein? You want to visualize it, successfully visualize it. And on your protein checklist, there should be several points included. Is it hydrophobic or hydrophilic? What expression level does it have? Is it abundant or very low expressed? Does it, where is it localizing? In which organelle is this protein localizing? So these are very important points that analysis you have to do at the desk before you go to the lab. It will save you a lot of time. But you may ask, how do I know, for example, expression level? Uh, I will show you how to check it. Uh, but also, uh, here are the databases, right? So, for example, PAX database, uh, it's a protein abundancy database, will uh, help you to estimate is the target protein low expressed or it, is it expressed in, in high quantities? Because uh, upon that, uh, you will need to include certain steps in your Western blot procedure. We have also the gene expression data. Of course, I'm aware that um, a protein can be, uh, th there can be quite a lot of mRNA, but very low, little of the product of the protein. However, this can provide you with a little bit of guidance regarding also in which organ uh, the this the the pro target protein is occurring the most for some proteins like for example for pins one has to uh, analyze a very very uh, root tip of a root not the whole root but one to two millimeters of the root tip to be able uh, to allow a visualization of the protein. We have also something um, very important, uh, which is a sample quality. Uh, we have done experiments analyzing samples which have been stored for quite many months, and we could see a gradual degradation of the target protein. So I am definitely advising you, especially for proteins of low abundance, to uh, work with freshly e extracted uh, proteins. Extraction can be done in different uh, way. The most time efficient extraction method is a bead beater. Here we showed result of results of extraction of algal samples using bead beater versus sonication. Sonication and mortar and pestle are quite time consuming extraction methods. And uh, if you are after reproducibility, I would advise you to look into extraction using bead beater uh, because several samples, up to 24, can be extracted at the same time. And the, especially for organisms with robust cell walls, uh, this extraction method is quite efficient. So please give it a thought uh, how you are extracting um, your protein. Uh, when you're using Morton and Pestle and you have 12 samples, uh, there may be a degradation of your target in sample number 12 compared to sample number one um, due to the time it takes to process them. 
uh, protein extraction method for low abundance proteins uh, involves fractionation. I know it is not a popular um, method because it's time consuming, but uh, there are also um, different possibilities here and it will also remember it will improve your results. Please take a look at this um, result where um, there was no target protein band in a total leaf sample and then with each step of fractionation uh, target protein became concentrated and finally visualized. In this case it was a protein of photosystem one which was not too abundant. I think that uh, many antibodies have been um, discarded because um, total cell extract was analyzed, it was quite discouraging. But you need to keep in mind that if your protein is of low abundance, you need to, uh, to do fractionation. It will really improve the outcome. Protein extraction methods are also involving different buffer composition. Here you can see that on the real experiment from one of Agricia test labs, changing buffer composition uh, changed also a possibility to detect the protein. The target protein band simply appeared when uh, a buffer, extraction buffer have been um, changed. Most commonly used is trees, but it does not have the most optimal buffer capa buffering capacities and hippies is often providing better results. In some cases, like in uh, this example, which I have, uh, uh, I'm showing you here to the right, uh, we have multi-species blot. So we have barley, arabidopsis and rice and the peptide is conserved in all three species what have been checked doing sequence analysis. But addition of a six molar urea was necessary to unfold the protein and make the peptide accessible for the antibody. Uh, I know that some laboratories are using urea in the gel and in extraction and loading buffers as a standard method. We need to also consider specific organ. Where is our target protein most abundant? Is it a root tip? Is it a senescent leaf? <laughs> so this is a very important part of your theoretical analysis. Of course, we need to include protease inhibitors, but sometimes also proteasome inhibitors. Uh, we, I, there was a case that Agrisiera developed a custom antibody and the lab was working for several months trying to detect it, detect the target protein, and it was just blank. ELISA was showing good results, uh, but the Western blood showed nothing. And the reason for it was that the protein seems to be a target for proteosomal degradation. Uh, in some cases, if you are working with proteins which are very unstable, uh, one of uh, recommended extraction methods uh, can be to simply extract in loading buffer and uh, heat the nature as soon as possible. Time is of importance when doing protein extraction. Uh, I have been asked uh, what to do, uh, what to consider when we are doing SDS page electrophoresis. So we have extracted the protein and we are moving on. Uh, I hope you're familiar with uh, the GLP. Uh, it means good laboratory practice. What does it mean? It means you're working clean, you're working in the cold. I know that many labs are uh, not running electrophoresis and Western blot in the cold, and I highly recommend to do it. Uh, you have to be precise, have uh, calibrated pipettes, fresh region stock, do not reuse um, reagents, and also follow the protocol and do it consistently. Another question I have received was uh, 
does SDS page formulation influence the outcome? Uh, some of you probably casting gels yourself, and some of you are maybe using precast gels. So why should we use this different precast gels? Uh, precast gels um, can actually help to increase consistency of the results. Uh, they have a certain molecular weight range, they have often uh, pH stability, and they have certain shelf life. And uh, depending upon the protein, you can see here that uh, the result can be better uh, depending upon which gel type we are choosing. Agricira is uh, using Novex gels from um, Invitrogen. Uh, which allow by changing buffer composition, one can get better molecular weight separation. So with the same gel, one can separate proteins of different molecular weight depending upon what we are working with. What is the, the difference between polyacrylamide gels, B-trees and trees glycine? I also got this question um, on one of the workshops. So here you have uh, the answer. One is good for neutral pH. Uh, the other one is good for resolving basic proteins. You will receive a PDF with uh, all these slides, so you will be easily able to go back to it and check. Uh, these trees can give a little bit sharper bands, but um, trees glycine may give you a lower resolution for proteins of higher molecular weight. Um, and it will also hydrolyze over time. So gel choice depends upon molecular weight of your protein. What should I load per well? Um, yeah, this is a very good question. I'm quite surprised that uh, how many laboratories are actually not measuring protein concentration. We recommend to measure protein concentration and uh, or alternatively for photosynthetic tissues, microgram uh, load based on microgram of chlorophyll. Quite often uh, volume is used. I mean, uh, if you're using more term pestle, you are not able to extract comparably between different uh, samples. And often as an argument I hear, it's not possible to measure protein concentration in extraction buffer or in the presence of SDS uh, or uh, denaturants and detergents. That's actually not true. There are reagents which will allow you to measure protein concentration in presence of these different compounds of uh, extraction buffer. So I highly recommend to load based on uh, protein, not based on volume. How much material should I have? Is it enough to have nanogram of micro or micrograms? <laughs> the answer is it also depends if you are loading on a gel um, purified protein, then we will be talking of nanograms. If you are loading on a gel an extract where your protein is quite low abundant, then of course you have to load more in terms of micrograms. When Agrisiera is um, testing uncharacterized antibodies, we are loading uh, 50 microgram per well or more if it's possible. So here you can see what happens uh, if you vary protein load per well. Uh, this is a downstream um, uh, step when you want to optimize your Western blot, then you can start playing with dilutions of primary antibody and uh, protein load per well. So here in this case, the antibody titer is quite high, as you see here. Uh, one would say, oh, it's unspecific, gives so much background, but it means that um, the, you need to dilute the primary antibody. So we are after good signal to noise ratio, and uh, I will also show you how to optimize, um, how to decrease the background uh, signal uh, from your blots. I also received the question, should I use one or two dimensional gels? Uh, and how does this affect the results? It of course depends upon what is your question. Uh, please keep in mind that when you separate your complex protein mix on a gel, it's based on one dimension. 
is based on molecular weight separation. The gel is polymerized and have big uh, holes on the top and small holes in the bottom, depending upon which percentage of a gel you choose, if it's a gradient gel. So when protein of high molecular weight will stay at the top of a gel, while the low molecular weight proteins will move downstream. Please remember that each such band, it's actually not only one protein, it's hundreds of proteins in each band, right? So one dimensional uh, gel e electrophoresis is um, suitable in certain applications, uh, while two dimensional gel electrophoresis will allow you uh, to separate um, proteins concentrated to a single band into further spots. So it all depends uh, upon what is your biological question. I see that one dimensional gels are uh, more frequently used than two dimensional gels, uh, which uh, it's also a procedure which is longer and takes more time. Sample denaturation is also another exciting topic <laughs> um, because it's not always good to boil the samples. There are different temperatures and variations of the protocol. We are using 70 degrees for five minutes. It's uh, absolutely enough to denature the protein. Actually, excessive boiling can lead to protein aggregation. And in some cases, like uh, in case of H plus ATPase, the aggregates may not be able to enter the gel. So there will be no band because your target protein is stuck it has aggregated during heating. Protein transfer conditions. As you see in our lab, we are running transfers in ice buckets. So we always um, do all steps with cold buffers and in the cold. How important are the conditions of a transfer? Is it better to run semi-dry transfer in a cold room to avoid overheating the instrument? So, <laughs> of course, cold is good. For protein work, um, we need to uh, keep it cold. There are certain differences also depending upon molecular weight of a protein you aim to detect. So this is also your theoretical work before you go to the lab. So you can see here, for higher molecular weight proteins, the membranes which uh, are used for transfer should have higher pore to allow protein uh, more easily uh, to be transferred to the membrane. Uh, high molecular weight proteins do not like so much of methanol, but they love SDS. And it is um, considered that tank transfer is better for high molecular weight proteins. But I know laboratories which will obtain good results uh, even uh, with semi-dry transfer with high molecular weight proteins. And for low molecular weight proteins, the conditions are a little bit opposite. Also, in case of low molecular weight proteins, lack of signal on the blot may be due to a small protein being actually blasted through the membrane because um, of too high voltage. OK, so this can also happen. So therefore, you need to be very careful when you're setting up your Western blot protocol. What are the differences in transfer efficiency between wet and semi-dry? Of course, we have more buffer needed for wet transfer. We have um, another contact with the electrode. And we have um, a speed which is much faster with semi-dry transfer. However, uh, the <laughs> wet transfer is less prone to failure, as it says. So if you are a beginner, I would recommend you to uh, start with the wet transfer. Uh, when working with Western blot, uh, there are no rules like this. One thing is better than the other. It all depends upon your protein antibody pair. And this comes to which membrane to use for protein transfer. We have PVDF or nitrocellulose. And actually what uh, many laboratories have both membranes in stock. Uh, 
because for some proteins, one can be better than the other. They differ in, in the way the protein is bound to the membrane, but also PVDF, this is why uh, we like that membrane very much, because PVDF can be air dried, protein side up, and rewet it. And uh, also this drying of the membrane will further fix the protein and unfold it. So it will lead to a better exposure of the linear epitopes, which, which is what we want for Western blot technique. PVDF has better protein retention, physical strength, and chemical compatibility. Nitrocellulose is a more fragile membrane. However, I have seen protein antibody pairs, which were working much better for um, nitrocellulose than for PVDF. It has to be empirically tested. Air bubble removal. Uh, I wonder if you know why air bubbles are, um, are bad. Uh, if, if the air bubble appears at the region of your target protein, let's say uh, in the middle of a membrane, uh, it may obscure the transfer. So that's why the air bubbles should be removed. Should it be done that way? No. <laughs> Actually, we have uh, we have discovered that in our hands, air bubble removal should be made in the cassette very gently, and uh, the sandwich should not be moved too much. So we assemble the sandwich in the cassette, and then we look if there are any air bubbles to press, and we do it extremely carefully. Uh, moving the sandwich can actually contribute to unsharp bands, so you need to remove air bubbles in the cassette, not like on the upper picture, and the sandwich has to be tightly secured in the cassette, so if it's too loose, then you can add some extra pads. Um, Sometimes if air bubbles are at the top of the membrane, uh, we will not care so much if our protein is of low molecular weight. Uh, protein transfer quality is checked by uh, Ponceau or Kumasi uh, uh, R250 reversible staining. Why shall we do that? When we are setting up Western blood protocol, uh, we are actually checking um, sample, how our sample is separated, uh, how is it looking, because we can save ourselves uh, the time later. So, of course, we will not continue with the blood looking like the one to the right. Uh, Ponceau can be easily washed away with water. We don't do this check every time. Uh, we do it when we have done some uh, major change with the sample, for example, or some other conditions. Uh, the more important is to check how many proteins are still left in a gel. Because if you remember that we should obtain exact copy of the gel. And in this experiment, we had two gels and two membranes in the same cassette. So you can see that when we stained the gel after uh, the transfer, it should be like the gel one, it should be empty, right? But we stained it with Kumasi and there was still lots of protein left. So we decided for quantification studies, for example, not to use the double sandwich because uh, we want to have an exact copy of a gel on the membrane, which was not the case. So I would like to encourage you to actually uh, stain your gels after the transfer to see if they are clear or not. Also, if you work with protein or proteins of low molecular weight, uh, then you can set a double uh, membrane. Uh, and this way you will see if you stain that membrane after Western blot, is uh, after transfer, if you see the proteins of low molecular weight on a second membrane, it will mean that they were blasted through the first one. 
So that can be the reason why there is no signal in your Western blot. This is true, especially for proteins of very uh, of uh, molecular weight like 10 kilodaltons. This happens quite often. Primary antibody format, which we are using, is also important for our successful detection. And we have. We can work with antibodies which are present in serum or which are purified and purified to total immunoglobulin fraction. So it will be a mix of not only your antibody, but all other antibodies present in serum. And as you remember, purification is done through the constant region of, uh, on, of the antibody. And be careful when you're reading product information sheets, because um, it can look like you're buying a lot of antibody, but if it is um, in a total immunoglobulin fraction, uh, your specific antibody will be only 1 to 5% of it, of these 200 micrograms. Uh, when the best format is when we are purifying antibodies on antigens, which can be peptides or proteins. And just um, I would like to tell you why should we use a purified antibody? As I mentioned, in total immunoglobulin fraction, only a small portion of that antibody pool will be your specific antibody. While when we are using antigen purified antibodies, then most of what you have in the tube in this 50 or 100 microgram will be your specific antibody. Short reminder how purification is done. Uh, we have columns uh, where we attach uh, antigen, which can be protein or peptide, uh, to uh, a resin. We are putting through the loading the serum, which as you see contains all different antibodies. Antibodies to your specific target will bind, and then upon elution, we will obtain specific antibody uh, fraction. This is how it is done in our lab at Acrisiera. We are working with small columns where we are, as most of our antibodies are made to peptides, we are using Ultralink and uh, we are conjugating peptides to the Ultralink. And that way we are purifying specific antibodies. And now it's a very exciting question. I know that uh, many antibodies are reused. They are expensive, precious reagents. And how long can the same aliquot of antibodies be used? Well, it can be used sometimes only one time reused, and sometimes it can be reused 20 times. So it is very antibody dependent. You cannot assume that because I used antibody a for 10 times reused, I can do it with the same with another antibody. It can happen that all antibody will bind to the target protein in the first incubation. And if you reuse this solution, there's no primary antibody left in it. So some antibodies can be reused and some cannot. And this is also an empirical uh, testing which has to be involved here. There are no golden standards, golden rules here. I know some labs which are reusing Agrisiera antibodies up to 20, 30 times. And another important question, primary antibody suddenly does not work any longer. What can be the reason? This can actually happen. Our antibody collection have been developed over the last 20 years, and we have seen that some antibodies can slowly deteriorate over the time. If you remember, polyclonal antibodies con consist of antibody pool, while monoclonal uh, contain only one specific antibody binding to one epitope. So if that antibody becomes unstable, monoclonal antibody will lose uh, reactivity directly, no signal. With polyclonal antibodies, you may see a gradual decline because they consist of antibody pool. So there may be still some of the antibodies binding and giving you the signal. 
So antibody stability over the time can decrease and it can depend upon temperature of storage, grade of purity, lack of stabilizer or use of the same antibody solution multiple times. And also, if you remember how the antibody looks like, like a Y um, letter, actually antigen binding domain is the part which will change. And that part is different for each antibody and it may influence its stability. So unfortunately, it's not possible to predict antibody stability over the time. Um, it may happen that the antibody you have used for last 10 years suddenly will actually stop working. There is unfortunately such possibility. So let's continue. Uh, this question was received uh, some time ago on one of the workshops. Uh, the researcher has a problem antibody is produced to the specific mitochondrial protein. It's purified, but it still doesn't work. Even with isolated mitochondrial sample. So his question was, can I poison this antibody by adding a protein extract from the mutant to it? And is there a thumb rule for how much of this extract should uh, I add? Actually, it is possible uh, to remove unwanted cross reactions by so-called depletion procedure. And uh, I would like to show you how to do it. So if you have a lot of cross reaction coming from a certain uh, protein, which is quite close to your target and you can't remove it, uh, you can actually um, use a sample from a mutant, which is lacking target protein, separate it on the membrane and then incubate your primary antibody with it. So the re uh, cross reactive antibodies will bind to the cross reaction, not to your target because that sample doesn't have your target. And that way you can afterwards take the solution which you incubated your mutant membrane with, with your primary antibody, uh, and use it on your desired membrane. And that way one can also remove uh, cross-reactivity uh, to Rubisco. So if your target protein is close uh, to Rubisco protein, uh, you can try to incubate your primary antibody solution with um, a Rubisco, with a strip containing Rubisco protein, so much of it that it will be easy to prepare uh, such uh, such strip. So this is uh, uh, actually a one possibility to still um, purify away uh, the background. And uh, following this blog post, you will receive more information. Uh, what to do when we have a lot of uh, background uh, coming up? And uh, here we're coming to the step of membrane blocking. How are we blocking? Is blocking temperature sensitive? Should it be four degrees room temperature or a different temperature? Answer is there are two options, one hour room temperature or four degrees overnight with agitation, but it is very dependent upon, upon protein antibody pair. And you can actually, uh, if you cannot continue with your Western blot procedure, you can stop at this, at, at this step. So you can actually, if you are working with PVDF membrane, uh, you can actually take it from a blocking solution, wash it, dry it protein side up and use it one or two weeks later. Uh, sometimes some um, unexpected things can happen. Um, maybe some reagent didn't come on time and what to do. You don't need to waste the whole uh, membrane which you have prepared. You can actually stop store it at that uh, point and use it later. But please don't use tweezers as uh, we did in, uh, in that ex example. The tweezers should have flat ends, not to damage the membrane. PVDF membrane can be stored for later use. And uh, this is what I mentioned. This is how we are doing it. It can be stored either on plastic bags or between Wattman sheets, we are storing our membranes up to six months. 
And remember that this can be done with PVDF membrane, not nitrocellulose. And each membrane has its serial number. And uh, of course, we have a description what have been separated and we know uh, the order of the samples. Uh, this is uh, also a very good way to prepare your membranes in advance, for example. This actually works very well. And now we're coming to blocking. Most uh, successful with plant samples, at least what I have seen over the last 20 years, is 5 to 10 percent non fat milk. Uh, on the second place are commercial blockers of uh, PDP40, which is non protein blocker, which is used by some laboratories. Actually, BSA is down the list. Uh, non fat milk is a protein mixture. So we have proteins of different molecular weights, while BSA is a small single protein. And I, I noticed that it's not so effective on protein samples. Uh, some laboratories are also using uh, gelatin. And uh, the effect results can be very different, as you see here. Uh, example, the lab was blocking 30 minutes, 1% uh, percent milk at room temperature. And then they returned uh, the message saying this antibody doesn't work. I said, OK, block longer. And look, the same set of samples, the same antibody, just blocking with high percentage of milk and uh, a little bit longer. And the result is very different. Uh, we have also, uh, for some protein antibody pairs, the blocking has to be done overnight. So this is, uh, you cannot say that blocking is always better to be done one hour room temperature or overnight. It depends upon protein antibody pair. There are no um, such rules which will say that one blocking time is better than the other. It has to be experimentally confirmed. Uh, it depends upon signal to noise ratio, which we can obtain for our protein antibody pair. Of course, it will be easier if the proteins abundant and antibody is of high titer. It may be more difficult for proteins of low expression. So one has to optimize this step. We can also titrate uh, the antibody for the best signal to noise ratio, as you see in this experiment. So once we know and confirm that the antibody is binding to the target protein, we can, as you see in this example, uh, test in which dilution the antibody can be used and the background will be diluted away. And here two different protein concentrations have been uh, tested. So this is like a fine tuning of your Western blot uh, procedure. I also received a question uh, how to reduce background signals while stripping and reprobing. And uh, I'm not so fond of stripping and reprobing because what can happen during stripping is that um, while you are breaking the bound between your target protein and antibody, you may also strip some of your target from the membrane. So one have to be aware of that. And this can also cause to increase the background signal because the signal to noise ratio uh, will be changed due to the target being washed away from, your, from the membrane. Uh, also, comparing primary antibodies. Uh, this is very commonly uh, done, <laughs> but um, I do not advise to do it because one cannot compare highly abundant actin with uh, an antibody to a protein of low expression. This simply does not work that way. So please avoid comparing antibodies in between. As you have seen, they are binding to very specific epitopes, to so very specific combinations of amino acids, and therefore direct comparison should be rather avoided. Antibody incubation buffers is also something um, which I have came across during my troubleshooting work. Most of labs are using TBST. Some laboratory, I would say 20% of laboratories are using PBST. 
And uh, also please remember that PBS T buffer is not suitable if you are working with phospho-specific antibodies. However, as you see in this example, for this protein antibody pair, PBS T buffer resulted in less background. Unfortunately, I'm unable to explain why, uh, but I wanted to uh, show uh, this uh, result with you. There's also a possibility to speed up your uh, Western blot protocol, and I will show you how to do it. Parallel incubations. Have you ever done it? One can incubate, for example, three antibodies at the same time. Yes, three primary antibodies at the same time. Of course, uh, these have to be antibodies you know how do they perform. So if you have some precious samples, you can actually plan the experiments. And if you know in which dilutions uh, these antibodies um, are to be used, you can incubate them together on the same membrane. This will save you quite a lot of work. Uh, second method is to uh, use um, everything at once. <laughs> Standard protocol, it is several hours of incubations, washes, and so on. However, for antibodies of high titer and um, for medium and high abundance of proteins, you can uh, try to incubate everything together. So blocking primary and secondary antibodies are added at once. Uh, of course, I wouldn't recommend this for uncharacterized antibody, but if you know the antibody performance, then you can give it a go uh, in, uh, in that way. For, but pr please remember not to transcription factors or proteins which are of low abundance. This will not uh, work. And the third method is to use directly conjugated primary antibodies. So we have uh, antibodies which are um, conjugated with enzymes or fluorochromes which are um, bound to primary antibody. That way, uh, the steps of washes and incubation with secondary antibodies can be omitted. However, please keep in mind, this is not a method for low abundance proteins, which may require the enhancing step uh, of addition of a secondary antibody. Secondary antibodies are provided in different hosts, and uh, depending upon uh, from which uh, host your primary antibody is coming, uh, then you need to uh, choose the right secondary antibody. It can look like a jungle um, because uh, there are many species primary antibodies can be uh, um, produced in. Uh, and also um, there's a sea of secondary antibodies which are available. Just a reminder, the detection is in epitope binding domain, which of course also secondary antibody will have, uh, and the changeable region and FC uh, region, the handle, which allows purification. Uh, there have been questions which secondary antibody to choose, and therefore I would like to uh, share with you this information. We have primary antibody made in the rabbit, so of course we are going to use anti-rabbit. But that anti-rabbit can be made in gold, donkey, chicken, it does not really matter. What you should look at is the dilution. So high dilution secondary antibody will last for very, very many, for thousands of blots. If it is used in high dilution, there will be less cross-reactions. And please do not exceed incubation time for more than one hour at room temperature. Is it absolutely no need to incubate longer, like for three hours or two days? I have seen also such protocols. And if you have a uh, high titer secondary antibody, usually when you when people are purchasing, they're looking at amount in the tube. One milligram for 180 euro or two milligrams for 180 euro. Of course, I will get more. No, you need to check the dilution at which secondary antibody is used and, and choose the antibodies which can be used in high dilution because this will allow you to conduct quite many experiments with one and the same reagent. 
and which secondary antibody to choose for Western blot. Here we have following alternatives. Goat anti-rabbit, heavy and light chain, uh, horseradish peroxidase conjugated. And then we have another one, which as you see here, it's written have minimal, minimum cross reactivity to bovine, human, goat, mouse, rat, HG. Which one would you choose? Uh, you may go after price, but I would suggest to, uh, <laughs> to go after dilution. And also in this specific case for plant extract, for example, uh, the first one will be enough. The second antibody is more suitable or more wanted for immunohistochemistry, for example, because what this means, minimum cross reactivity, it means that this antibody preparation have been passed for through different columns and cross reactivity to um, bovine, human, goat, mouse, rat, IgG has been removed. So this is like a fine tuned product. Uh, usually these absorbed, so-called absorbed antibodies are required for immunohistochemistry. For Western blot, it's enough with um, uh, this simple format. And H plus uh, H and uh, L means heavy and light chains of IgG. Now we're coming to detection. We're closing in. Soon we will see visualization of our target protein. Most frequently used detection method is uh, chemiluminescent. Uh, so we have a, um, it's based on uh, enzymatic reaction, and the product of that reaction is um, chemiluminescence, which is recorded by CCD camera or in the past on X ray film. And as you he see here, uh, depending upon which ECL reagent you will choose, with uh, mid picogram detection range or extreme low femtogram detection range, you will get different result. And of course, uh, one can say, oh, this is awful antibody. No, it's too sensitive detection reagent. So you can just wash your membrane and develop it with less sensitive detection reagent, ECL detection reagent. Agrisiera offers it as a set. So you can purchase two different ECL reagents in one set and then use it depending upon uh, abundance of your target protein. Here, PSBA was detected, which is quite abundant photosynthetic protein, so no need to use a high sensitivity ECL detection reagent. Advantages of ECL detection is its sensitivity and uh, it allows also quantification. Uh, however, recorded signal, uh, signal has to be recorded immediately. It is suitable for quantification and analysis of proteins present in low levels. Actually, I have seen this over the years that uh, the lab was fighting with uh, using chromogenic detection with alkaline phosphatase and uh, they couldn't get any signal. When they moved to ECL, uh, it was no problem uh, with the detection. Sometimes maybe you have seen the ghost bands. And why, why are we seeing them? So it's excess. They are due to excess of secondary antibodies. Too much target, too much of the enzyme. Secondary antibody may be too concentrated. It needs to be diluted further. Please do not be scared to use primary secondary antibodies at like 1 to 25,000, uh, for example. Uh, and it can also be due to antibody mismatch. Another exciting question. Uh, regarding ECL, something went wrong. I, I've done something wrong. Can I just wash um, the membrane and develop it again? Fortunately, yes. Without stripping, you can still do it. So you can wash the membrane, apply uh, ECL again, and uh, continue with documenting your result. Second detection method, which is not as popular as, uh, as chemiluminescence, is fluorescent. It also requires CCD camera for uh, recording the result. And we have a fluorescent dye, which is conjugated to secondary antibodies. Oftentimes, uh, companies providing uh, CCD cameras are also offering 
already conjugated secondary antibodies. I have seen that in some cases, uh, there may be, by some strange reason, there was no match between that secondary antibody which was provided and the primary antibody. Uh, so this lack of matching can also happen, and this can contribute to lack of uh, a signal on your Western blot. Advantages of fluorescence is that, as you see in this example, it uh, allows multiplexing. Uh, on, a, on this picture, you can see that um, there are two different target proteins which are visualized. So this is a very good si system for that. Uh, this advantage is that um, it has uh, it requires dedicated equipment and it has lower sensitivity compared to chemiluminescence, but suitable for quantification and multiplexing. And the third method is color uh, colorimetric. If there are no um, uh, CCD camera available, then we can use uh, colorimetry. So we are using secondary antibodies conjugated with an enzyme called alkaline phosphatase. And the result looks like this. Uh, can be recorded with a naked eye. We see if uh, a target protein band is detected or not. It's inexpensive as fast, but it has low sensitivity and uh, we do not advise to do quantification but it's suitable for quick assessment. And also you can store uh, the membrane in your lab book, but please be aware that it may fade over the time. And also please remember, no PBS containing buffers can be used due to interference with um, uh, this detection system. So fortunately, final result is good. So as you see, there are three detection methods. And in some laboratories, it's uh, it's good to have uh, two options. So if um, the, there is no detection with one, you can try the other. Uh, because uh, sometimes the other detection method can actually be successful. How to determine molecular weight of a target protein detected on the Western blot? Well, I would strongly advise you to use markers with IgG binding site. So when we do electrophoresis, we are using um, the colored markers, which will show us the progress uh, of the electrophoresis, but we combine them with uh, these uh, markers with IgG binding site. So we load them on the same in the same well. And then as a result, we can easily visualize um, the ladder already during um, blood development. And uh, I have seen cases where um, the results were misinterpreted because markers were aligned in the, were aligned wrongly. So, I, if possible, I would like to strongly recommend you to use the markers which will uh, be visualized during the development of the uh, of your blot. This can be really really helpful. And these markers with IgG binding type. Uh, site, as you see, will, are compatible with all three detection methods. So please always include markers, molecular weight markers uh, on your blots. And uh, we are using magic marks, which has uh, which have a very nice span uh, of uh, molecular uh, weights. <laughs> and this question was also received once upon a time. How to get an intense signal from Western blot using a weak antibody? Well, in this case, I would like you to go back to the desk and start analyzing uh, steps of your protocol. What sample type? Did you use an optimal sample type? If your proteins of low expression, did you do fractionation? How much protein did you load per well? Do you have optimal transfer conditions or is your protein blasted through the membrane? Did you use antigen purified antibodies? Did you use appropriate detection re reagent? Maybe you used uh, alkaline phosphatase uh, and chromogenic detection while you should go for chemiluminescence. All these steps are called optimization. And this theoretical analysis can be done 
at the desk. Please do not run um, blot after blot. Uh, I have seen many such cases and uh, just theoretical analysis of your prot protocol would help you to determine what to change um, before doing so many experiments. Here you can see an example of the optimization before and after and check what has been changed here. The protein load is 10 times less. The rest was kept the same. So it can be so easy as uh, one factor. Of course, first comment would be of oh, this antibody is not specific. It's not true. Uh, it is the signal to noise ratio which needs to be optimized. In this specific case, I would also um, maybe incubate primary antibody during day, during one hour during day. I wouldn't um, do it overnight. Uh, in principle, please avoid extensive and long incubations because they can, as you see here, contribute to the background signal. I have the advice for beginners. Record correct band first before multiplying variations of conditions. And here, if you are working with antibody which has not been characterized, I would advise you, you got it from a friend, you don't know how it's going to work on your uh, samples. I assume that you check the sequence so you know that antibody has a predicted reactivity. Uh, I would suggest to include a mutant sample to be sure that the, the antibody is really recognizing the target. Uh, overload the protein and then also use the primary antibody uh, in uh, concentrated and with overnight incubation. Uh, this is a protocol which we're using for uncharacterized antibodies because of course there can be a lot of background here but because we overload the, the well there are bigger chances uh, that uh, um, target protein band is going to be detected. So this is the protocol which I would like to recommend you also if uh, you would like to. You, you got an unknown antibody, you don't know how it behaves, because if you get uh, a target band very strong, then you can, of course, optimize the conditions and uh, change these parameters. But this is like overloading the system and this is very helpful. I have the advice for experienced users. That's the mistake which you're doing. <laughs> you use the same protocol for all antibodies and uh, it's actually not the case. As you have seen maybe in my presentation, I hope uh, each protein antibody pair may uh, behave a bit differently. And hopefully after optimization, you will obtain a good result. If you still have such blots, <laughs> I would like to um, advise you to contact AgriSierra. You are always welcome. I have seen uh, lots of such blots over the years and uh, I may be able to uh, help. And now I hope you're not too tired. Um, I would like to share with you some uh, misconceptions about the antibodies. So please think about your answer. Other antibodies I bought from Agrisiera work, therefore this one should work too. True or false? <laughs> Answer for yourself. False. Each protein antibody pair is different. Antibody works for spe species A. For sure, it will also work for species B. True or false? If the sequence of the peptide used to elicit the antibody is not conserved in the species B, it's not going to work. So one cannot do this assumption. Same protocol can be applied for all antibodies. False. Antibody gives a good signal in the Western blot, therefore it should also work in other techniques. True or false? False. Uh, the antibody which works in Western blot is validated suitable for Western blot. If it's going to perform in another technique, it needs to be experimentally uh, determined. 
based upon which part of the protein is used to elicit an antibody, we can actually predict if it may work in, for example, for immunoprecipitation. If a peptide comes from exposed region on a protein, the antibody may work in immunoprecipitation. So please keep in mind that you can save yourself a lot of time in the lab uh, by the theoretical analysis. And if you don't know these answers, ask for help. <laughs> you can also visit AgriSierra technical blog where we are sharing uh, different um, news based on the results which we receive from you. And also, I would like to bring up something that is very important. Which information about antibodies should be included in scientific publications and why is it important? There is unfortunately no worldwide standard for that, which, is, which makes it very difficult uh, to know which antibody has been applied in a scientific work. So when you are uh, writing a paper, please remember to include antibody name, number and supplier as well as Western protocol details, that would be nice. Um, because lack of it is really leading to um, very high reproducibility crisis. So uh, this will also help you in the future if you do it in your articles. Uh, it is not advertising for antibody supplier. It is a reliable information which is supposed to make a researcher who wants to repeat your experiments uh, to know which antibody have you used, especially uh, antibodies to epitope tags. There can be several in a catalog. So just writing anti-GFP antibody will not point out which exactly antibody has been uh, used. So let's help to increase reproducibility in the future. Uh, you're welcome to use Western blood resources on our website. Uh, you are always welcome with the questions. And uh, I, I can help you even if you are not using antibody from AgriSierra. Uh, I would like to also uh, share with you information about free resources. So uh, educational posters, which are prepared with scientists in the field. Uh, we also uh, we have also developed together with American Society of Plant Biology a calendar, Global Plant Science Events calendar, where you can find not only conferences, but also webinars and other online events, which are often free of charge. And there is also a pool of images extracted from our posters, which you can use for free, which are available on our website. If you would like to receive newsletter, uh, with information about our antibodies, please let me know. And um, now a surprise, we offer 100 free antibodies. Uh, and uh, <laughs> the list is updated every week. There's no limit on provided antibodies, but we would like uh, to receive re uh, results in three months. We will ship the antibody free of charge, provide you with secondary antibodies and ECL. The list you can find following this link. There are different antibodies there uh, to photosynthetic proteins, uh, plant, algal, bacterial. I would like to encourage you to, uh, to check it. And this uh, webinar has been brought to you together with our distributor in uh, Spain and Portugal. Uh, if you are from these countries, you're very welcome to, uh, to contact them. And if you are from other countries, please contact support at uh, agrisiera.com. Thank you uh, for today. Uh, fortunately, the snowstorm didn't disturb our internet connection. I would like to wish you good luck with your blots. And if you would like to receive Particip uh, certificate of participation, please write it in the chat. Thanks a lot, Joanna, for the nice webinar.